thank you so much to the organizers um, to, for the invitation. I feel so humbled to be here um, and so grateful. I thought I, I should start off with an explanation and an, and an anecdote because I did change my title just slightly and I added the word citizenship in there, which you'll see. Okay. Um, so the description you see in the, um, the abstract I provided in the program is really, I think, a synopsis of my dissertation. Um, and what I have today is a paper that's specifically about citizenship. Um, and I think you'll get an idea through this paper of what I'm doing in my dissertation and how I'm doing it. But I wanted to say that citizenship is in large part what brought me to my doctoral program. Um, at the United Nation of Wisconsin, we've been reviewing our citizenship criteria for about 20 years now. Um, and we, we currently use blood quantum to determine eligibility. Um, and in 2017, uh, the nation sent out a survey to all of its tribal membership um, to gain perspectives, to gather perspectives about um, new criteria or existing criteria. And the last question on the survey was, what does it mean to you to be an Oneida citizen? And, and you, you completed that answer um, on your own. Um, and that, it took me a long time to answer that question. I sat with that question for some time and I see my work um, being, it, it's that is me going to Oneida people in time and asking them that question. What does being an Oneida citizen mean to you? Um, and so I do that with people in Wisconsin, but also people in New York. Um, and so I thought I would um, offer just that explanation. So let me begin. On December 24th, 1877, Abram Elm won an uneasy victory in the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of New York. Judge William James Wallace ruled that Elm had been wrongfully convicted. The defendant could not be a criminal, the judge reasoned, because he was a citizen of the United States. One year earlier, Elm and Louis Doxtater, both Oneida Indians living in the town of Lenox in Madison County, New York, had visited their local polling station to cast their votes for Scott Lord, Democratic candidate for Congress. After submitting their ballots, Elm and Doxtater were summarily arrested and jailed by the local magistrate. As Indians, they were not protected by the recently passed 14th Amendment and therefore were ineligible to vote. Elm and Doc Tater's attorney appealed the conviction and the case was sent to federal court in the spring of 1877. To arrive at his opinion in United States v. Elm, Judge Wallace considered several factors. He reflected upon the various classes of residents in the United States, such as foreign ambassadors and their US born children, and contemplated whether each reasonably fell within the purview of the 14th Amendment. He examined New York State's tax laws and their application to Indians in general, and Oneida in particular. And finally, he evaluated the so-called integrity of the Oneida tribe and government. After assessing each of these areas, Wallace firmly concluded that Abram Elm was an American citizen. In Wallace's estimation, Elm and other Oneidas living in New York no longer exhibited the hallmarks of Indian identity. Oneida people lived and worked among the American public, they were obligated to pay taxes to the state of New York, and they fell outside the Oneida government's jurisdiction. So from Wallace's perspective, when parties of Oneida fled the state of New York for Wisconsin a half century earlier, the center of Oneida government removed with them. For these reasons, Wallace resolved with no sense of irony, Oneida Indians were natives. He declared they owe no allegiance other than, other than to the government of the United States, and they have been placed by the state upon an equality with its citizens respecting important rights denied to aliens. Wallace continued, as the state and the United States can impose upon them all the duties and obligations of subjects, the Oneida are entitled to the corresponding rights which spring from relation. These are the rights which a government owes to its citizens. I share this vignette because of the way Wallace's ruling effectively flattens the multidimensionality of Oneida identity by isolating American citizenship from Oneida citizenship. 10 years before the passage of the Dawes Act and nearly 50 years before the passage of the Indian Citizenship Act, Wallace maintained that the United States and New York both recognized Oneida Indians living in the Empire State exclusively as American citizens. However, Wallace failed to consider whether Abram Elm, Louis Doxtater, and other Oneida people recognized themselves in the same way. Historian Lawrence Hopman recently countered Wallace's opinion and argued that Elm and Doxtater did not relinquish their Oneida citizenship in claiming American citizenship at the polls. Rather, they viewed voting in general 
and for Congressman Scott Lord in particular, as a strategy to defend and protect Oneida sovereignty. So in other words, exercising the corresponding rights of American citizenship offered an opportunity to safeguard Oneida citizenship. This perspective, of course, is missing from the ruling in United States v. Elm, and Wallace's opinion, though incomplete, went on to circulate among a generation of assimilationist policymakers. This decision and its erasure of Oneida perspectives begs the question of how Oneida people understood themselves at the height of the assimilation era. If we could travel across time to ask, how would they respond? These are questions I pursue in my study of Oneida sovereignty in the early 20th century. Despite the widespread attempt in this period to dissolve tribal nations once and for all, Oneidas living in New York and Wisconsin carefully preserved distinctively Oneida traditions to remain distinctly Oneida people. But this does not mean they resisted change. Rather, they adopted and adapted new ideas and new technologies like American citizenship if they believed it would help future generations remain distinctly Oneida too. So we can find evidence of this in two important sources compiled during the first half of the early 20th century. So the 1922 report of the new, of, well, this is a real long title, report of the New York State Indian Commission to investigate the status of the American Indian residing in the state of New York, um, informally and thankfully known with a much shorter title the, the Everett, as the Everett Report after the assemblyman who was its chair. Um, and we also have a collection of over 800 stories recorded by employees of two separate Works Progress Administration programs conducted in Oneida, Wisconsin between 1939 and 1942. These sources contain first-hand accounts from Oneida people navigating the compounding challenges of assimilation, the First World War, and the Great Depression. Unsurprisingly, these individuals present a very different picture of the Oneida experience than the one drawn by Judge Wallace in United States v. Elm. In their own words, Oneida people and these sources tell us who they are. They are Oneida in New York and Oneida in Wisconsin. They are Oneida in a city and while serving overseas. And they remain Oneida even as citizens of the United States of America. What we learn when we hear from Oneida people directly is abundantly clear. Oneida sovereignty and by extension Oneida citizenship is multidimensional. Oneida sovereignty transcends space, both geographic and political, and it transcends time by bridging the past with the present to locate Oneida people and peoplehood in the future. So let me begin with some historical context here. A first step in understanding any expression of Oneida sovereignty made by Oneida people invokes looking at the role, invokes, involves looking at the role played by the Oneida in the Haudenosaunee Alliance. So the Oneida are one of six Iroquoian nations united several hundred years ago to become the people of the Longhouse. This structure used by Iroquois people and others became for the Haudenosaunee a symbol of their political alliance, with each nation assigned a role to assure the house's protection. So the Mohawk and Seneca became doorkeepers and variously greeted or repelled visitors approaching Haudenosaunee territory from the east and west. The centrally located Onondaga adopted the role of firekeeper and managed the Haudenosaunee seat of government, and the Oneida and Cayuga were deemed little brothers and took on the task of caring for other nations in need. As an example, in the wake of the Seven Years' War, the Oneida exercised their role as little brother to resettle refugee tribes, including the Nanticoke, Tudelo, Conoy, Delaware, and Mohican in the Susquehanna Valley, immediately south of Oneida territory. And just a few de decades earlier, they brought the Tuscarora, the last nation to join the Haudenosaunee Alliance under their care. Famously, at least for Oneida people, infamously for others, Oneida has also supported the Americans in their fight for independence from Great Britain. The rationale behind this decision has been the subject of scholarly speculation for decades. Did the Oneida support the American Revolution out of concern for the Oneida economy, which increasingly relied on American supplied goods? Were they influenced by their non-native friends and allies who identified with the American cause? Did decision-making power shift in this period to sympathetic Oneida warriors? These factors and more were likely at play in the Oneida's choice but surely no factor carried as much weight as the United Nations' own understanding of itself as a guardian with an obligation to look after others. Despite their allyship and the significance it held to them as a little brother of the Longhouse, the Oneida, of course, were not spared uh, the devastations of American expansion. Though they negotiated a treaty with the nascent United States in 1784 to secure their land base in perpetuity, the Oneida lost nearly six million acres over the next 60 years. 
The rise of the Empire State required the removal of the centrally located Oneida, a process New York State officials eagerly ratified through a series of illegal treaties. As their territory waned, so did their options, and by the 1820s, Oneida found themselves wondering not only what their future held, but also where it could be guaranteed. And for many, the future lay elsewhere, either west in Wisconsin or north in Canada. By 1839, just 578 Oneidas shared the last 4,000 acres of the Oneida homeland in central New York. What then did Oneida life look like in the century that followed? In 1919, New York State officials found themselves asking this very question and appointed a commission led by Assemblyman Edward A. Everett to find out. This renewed concern for Oneidas, along with other Indians living in the state, stemmed from a recent decision rendered in the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of New York. So we're coming full circle here. And a complete reversal from Judge Wallace's earlier ruling in 1877, Judge George Ray determined in April of 1919 that Oneida held properties could not be foreclosed because Oneida Indians fell outside New York State's jurisdiction. Foreclosure proceedings against a local Oneida man were declared null and void, and a judgment was entered to reinstate him to his property. New York State officials were perplexed by Judge Ray's decision. The state had been distributing funds and annuities to the Oneida and other resident Indian communities for years, but it could not legally continue to do so if these communities fell outside New York's jurisdiction. Suddenly, a state James Madison once described as lacking all quote, duty and decorum and its treatment of Oneida people worried whether it was following the law and its affairs with Indians. To resolve this dilemma, the Everett Commission turned to New York Indians directly and asked whether they understood themselves to be subjects of the state or the federal government, which is a comical exercise, but um, in some ways we have to appreciate it. After conducting listening sessions on reservations across New York and making a brief stop at the Six Nations Reserve in Canada, the Everett Commission submitted its findings to the state legislature on March 17, 1922. Writing on behalf of the commission, Chairman Everett concluded that the status of Indians in New York was clear. Quote, by consummating treaties with them, he wrote, we have recognized them as a nation. He then insisted that both the government of New York and the federal government were responsible for New York Indians, not in the matter of jurisdiction though, but in the matter of redress. Everett held that New York owed Indians living in the state far more than the cost of health care and reservation schools, and he encouraged state officials to consider what resolution they might hope for if they were in the Indians' position. In a shocking and yet somehow unsurprising move, the Everett report was rejected by the state legislature and promptly buried. It is only available to us today because the commission's stenographer, Lulu G. Stillman, retained a copy for her personal records. This is true. <laughs> Now that we have context, let's consider the perspectives of two Oneida individuals who repeatedly appear in the Everett Report, Joseph Joe Johnson and Chief Chapman Scanandoa. Joe Johnson was born in Oneida Castle Village in 1876 and had four siblings, all of whom passed away before Johnson turned 50. Beyond this, I've uncovered few other details about Johnson's life and the specific motivations that drove him to attend the commission's listening sessions. Chapman Wilton Scanandoa Sr., referred to as Chief Scanandoa in the report, was born in 1870 and lived in Lenox, New York, before traveling to Chicago to enlist in the U.S. Navy in 1897. He served in the Spanish-American War and was discharged in 1912. Scanandoa eventually moved to the Onondaga Reservation, where many Oneidas chose to live after the dissolution of the Oneida land base. And it was here that the Everett Commission held its listening session with Oneida people on August 17, 1920. Johnson and Scanandoa to, took two very different approaches to engaging the commission, where Johnson used humor and satire to illustrate the Oneida experience and Oneida mistreatment. Scanandoa used humility and analogy. However, both men invoked the Oneida tradition of guardianship to make their point. Johnson began his testimony by reflecting on past commissions sent to New York Indian communities on what he called flying trips. The commissioners stop on the outside of the reservation and ask some Irishmen about the Indians and then report on what the Irishmen said, he railed, before lamenting, we have been held to a certain degree as a nuisance in the state. Johnson contrasted New York's fickle behavior with Indian loyalty. In the first place, I would like to call your attention to the loyalness of an Indian, he told the commission. The loyalness of the Indian was shown when the Indian sided with the white man, with the United States. 
He then reminded the commissioners that during the First World War, Indians voluntarily enlisted, whereas Americans were compelled to serve by the draft. He explained, we wanted to help the government in which we lived. We were not citizens by any means, and when it came to buying bonds, we went to the full extent of our pocketbooks. Resonant and Johnson's testimony are allusions to the Oneida as the nurturing little brother. The Oneida did not need to be citizens to serve. They did so because serving was integral to their understanding of themselves as Oneida people. But Johnson did indeed support American citizenship, if and only if it guaranteed an Oneida future. Johnson expressed to the commission, we only today ask for a fair decision and then whatever comes after, if it is citizenship, all right. I lived most of my life among the white people, but I am an Indian and will be one of the first to accept citizenship if it is going to benefit all the Indians. I will be the first to advocate citizenship among the Indians. We depend on the future generations. The image drawn by Johnson here is something akin to a nested citizenship in which American citizenship serves as a vessel that ultimately prote protects and transmits Oneida citizenship into the future. When Johnson said that he depended on future generations, he meant that he depended on them to maintain Oneida values and traditions, or in other words, he depended on them to remain distinctly Oneida. Where Johnson's embrace of American citizenship was conditional, Skenandoa's embrace was total. As Skenandoa imagined what fair treatment and harmony across the human race might look like, he suddenly segued, speaking about putting Indians on an equal basis, I surmise we should become citizens. Skenandoa believed that citizenship would guarantee Indians an equal stake in charting America's future. He relayed to the commission, if I had my rights and if you want to help the Indian, do away with the old way, give him election vote for the United States president. Don't you think that possible? Skenandoa went on to say that protecting the Indians' right to vote, quote, would be an honor for what he did to help set up your government. You cannot deny, and your history cannot deny, that our forefathers helped in your battles, and every war you had, the Oneidas helped. Over the past few days, we've considered the way the United States government presented American citizenship as an expression of its care for Indian people. Here, Skenandoa completely inverts that meaning and instead roots citizenship in the Oneida tradition of guardianship. In effect, Skenandoa is saying, we as Indians cared for you, America. American citizenship for Indian people is an acknowledgement of our care. This is clearly very different than the Onondaga's perspective on citizenship, which we often hear quoted. And this difference is remarkable since Oneida and Onondaga people were living together. Even living among Haudenosaunee people, Oneida still retained a sense of themselves as distinctly Oneida, and they thought in a way that was consistent with their own understanding of themselves as Oneida people. Now I'd like to move across time and space to Oneida, Wisconsin in the late 1930s and early 1940s. In this period, the Oneida community hosted two separate but related WPA projects, the Oneida Language and Folklore Project and the Oneida Ethnological Study. Both employed bilingual Oneidas to interview other Oneidas and record, transcribe, and translate their stories. The WPA stories, as we call them today, cover a wide range of material and delve into both recent history and the distant past. American citizenship is referenced frequently in the WPA collection in ways that are both similar to and very different from references found in the Everett Report. One key difference we see in the WPA archive is the connection Wisconsin Oneida drew between citizenship and ownership writ large. So let me provide some quick context to help explain what I mean here. Until the passage of the Dawes Act, Oneida and Wisconsin collectively stewarded nearly 65,000 acres. But in 1892, these were divided and distributed among 1,503 Oneida allottees. Following stipulations outlined in the Allotment Act, fee simple patents were not to be issued at Oneida for another 25 years. However, in 1906, an Appropriations Act for the Office of Indian Affairs and the Burke Act shaved 11 years off this timeline. Fee patents were issued rapidly and Wisconsin Oneida suddenly found themselves tax paying citizens. Surprisingly, many Oneidas welcomed this change. Since the Supreme Court's decision in United States v. Cook in 1873, the Oneida were prohibited from logging their reservation and thus barred from participating in and generating profits from the thriving local timber industry. In a WPA story recorded in 1941, an interviewee identified as Mrs. M.E.S., so we only have her initials, um, and so we don't have um, a pro profile of who she was, recalled the changes of, a main, of maintaining a home and family in 1886. The only surplus we had at that time was wild game, which I would say was something like surplus, 
But otherwise, it was hard to make money because you couldn't sell anything as you like, she explained. Everything had to be consulted to the government agency or the Oneida police, whether you could sell that wood or not. That's the way it was before we became citizen. After allotment, Mrs. MES observed that Oneidas, quote, were a little more free, and especially when the deeds were issued out then up to each individual to get along the best way they knew how. And they were more free to sell anything they want to sell, like wood or logs and other things which they might have. This might explain why Oneidas like Solomon Wheelock, a farmer all his life, according to his obituary, literally lined up to accept American citizenship. At the time we were made citizens of our country, he recollected, we were called together at one big meeting and we were asked to line up in a row and all that was in favor of becoming citizens should step up ahead and form a new line. The majority stepped out and just a few stayed in their places and all of us that stepped out got our deeds for our properties. In possession of a fee patent, Oneidas could finally resume authority over their land and fully exercise the rights of ownership. So more research is needed here to see if this analysis really holds. But I want to suggest that the concepts of property, land ownership, and ownership in general in this period took on special significance for Oneida people in Wisconsin. So that is, private land ownership meant more than just the ability to buy and sell. Transcripts in the WPA archive contain numerous references to upstanding Oneida citizens. Sometimes these individuals are expli explicitly identified, and other times interviewees provide only a general character description. Regardless, in many instances, the leading citizens of the Oneida community are described as homeowners, or the owners of nice or improved homes, and in a few rare instances, they are described as both homeowners and veterans. So for instance, on two occasions, Guy Elm, an employee of the Oneida Ethnological Study, observed that ex-World War veterans are the leading citizens in their communities. Most of them have families and own their own homes. And again, the veteran, most of them have families. They own their own homes, got swell cars, good jobs, and they love their families and their country. And a separate example, William Atoxen, another D WPA employee, described how he bought a two acre lot and a house, which he paid off before buying a one acre lot and house for his parents. Shortly thereafter, he was elected town treasurer, a position his wife, Evangeline Wheelock Matoxen, also held for the Oneida Township for 11 years. We could read these as examples of Oneida acculturation and more specifically Oneida adoption of American materialism and conspicuous consumption, but I think that would be an oversimplification. Perhaps the ownership of land and houses, even cars, served as a contemporary metric of Oneida citizenship and more specifically the capacity of Oneida people to carry on the tradition of service. And I've been thinking about you know, Oneida were not indigenous, of course, to this area. Was ownership a way of asserting belonging and asserting, creating a sense of belonging to a place that they did not always, had not always known as their own? I don't know. Well, I, well to be continued there. The Everett Report and WPA stories are treasure troves for scholars of Oneida intellectual history and Haudenosaunee intellectual history more broadly. Given our time constraints, I've shared just a snapshot of what they offer. And I want to be clear that the Oneida perspectives documented in these sources are not homogenous. Plenty of Oneida people rejected American citizenship because they believed it would erode rather than reinforce Oneida sovereignty. And as several WPA stories reveal, many Oneidas in Wisconsin eventually regretted accepting American citizenship because it led to the near total loss of the Oneida reservation. My point in highlighting Oneida's support for American citizenship, whether tacit or full-throated, is that seemingly surprising decisions by Native people might appear less surprising when we consider the values and beliefs underlying them. In this instance, I see the values and beliefs underlying Joseph Johnson's, Scap Chapman Scanandoa's, Solomon Wheelock's, and other support for American citizenship as distinctively Oneida. And this leads me back to when and where we began. Okay. Okay. Um, in 1877, Judge Wallace ruled that Oneidas like Abram Elm and Louis Dox Tater were entitled to vote because they appeared to lead conventionally American lives and therefore must be American citizens. That Elm and Dox Tater were simultaneously leading distinctly Oneida lives is not a conundrum nor contradiction and certainly not a negation. At least it wasn't for Elm and Dox Tater, and so it shouldn't be for us. Instead, their lives are reflections of the dynamic, multidimensional experience of Oneida people, and their choices are expressions of a multidimensional Oneida sovereignty. Thank you.